risk factors well associated in the treatment modalities that can reduce risk as well. Cholesterol has turned out, initially it was a, a question of whether it would reduce stroke, but if you look at the most recent meta-analysis from this last week, you can see that cholesterol reduction leads to a significantly reduced risk of stroke. And it can reduce stroke as much as 33% in risk. It reduces primary stroke, that is before you've had your stroke. If you've had a stroke, getting the cholesterol down also reduces your chance of a second stroke or secondary prevention at that point in time. And it looks like the targets for reducing stroke are very similar to have reducing a heart attack. LD, if you've had a stroke, we want your LDL cholesterol under 70. Under 70 is the target. Similar targets, similar risk factors uh, for both stroke and heart attack that we see. Now, that's why we're here today. And we're here today to look at how are we doing in California and in Sacramento for reducing blood pressure, treating cholesterol, and diabetes. And what you will see in the next three presentations is data. First is going to be high blood pressure. And you can see controlling high blood pressure under 140 over 90 at the various centers that we have identified in, in Sacramento. Hill Physicians, Kaiser Roseville, and Kaiser Sacramento, and South Sac. Mercy Dignity System, Sutter, Sutter Independent, and UC Davis. Now these are pretty good numbers for control. You can see they are well above 50% and some are getting close to the 74 or 75% target there. But I think you sit in the back of the room and you could say, we can, these are good, but we can do a better job. We can improve and get better numbers for blood pressure, for controlling blood pressure in diabetics, that's clearly important in that population, uh, for controlling glucose, and, and getting people on the right cholesterol reduction, often meaning statins at this point in time. So there are a long ways to go that we can improve in looking at these numbers as we look at the healthcare systems that are sitting here and delivering care in Sacramento today. So we've got our mission today to look at this. We're gonna bring up three systems and see what are they using to try to further improve their outcomes or their metrics for that. And then we're going to uh, shift briefly to hypertension. Uh, we're gonna introduce, and you all have on your table cards, which are preliminary hypertension cards that CDPH uh, is considering uh, printing and passing out to approximately 20,000 uh, 20, physicians in the state of California to outline for us and for the physicians and healthcare providers directly what are the indications for blood pressure. And you can see we've come down a little bit lower. The new goals are slightly lower in blood pressure, went from 140 now to under 130 in many cases if the patient tolerates it. And the medicines that are often required are here. But let's not forget lifestyle. Lifestyle is critically important for blood pressure. You can bring down your blood pressure 5 to 15 millimeters with intensive lifestyle modifications themselves. You always start with those, but we have to make sure we always finish with those as well. They're part of any treatment plan for individuals with hypertension. In the last part of the program, we're going to focus on a presentation by uh, Jessica on the Prevention Forward Program of the California Department of Public Health, where they've identified a number of areas in the state of California, and they're work working directly in their prevention program to improve the health of Californians through the prevention and management of diabetes and heart disease and stroke. So this is an important thing, supported nationally, but implemented here in California, and will be implemented in Sacramento as well. So we look forward to those presentations, because we, in fact, as Bruce started us out, we're here to make things better for individuals and to prevent the devastation that can occur with stroke and heart disease in California and in Sacramento. 
So with that, I'd like to present our first presentation. Uh, I think Dr. Valba is, uh, Ben is going to present. He is the medical director for Dignity Health here locally. He's been introduced uh, as well. He's played a large part in improving the health care of that dignity and the Mercy medical system. So Dr. Valda is going to present the program that they have uh, and are using to implement and improve metrics and ultimately outcomes in the Mercy Dignity Healthcare System. Thanks, Pam. And before we go to Dr. Balakba, uh, I just want to compliment our chairman for the last few years, Bill Romer. If you look at what's happened with the blood pressure control at UC Davis, it's nothing less than phenomenal. So 90th percentile both for diabetics and uh, the rest of the population. That's really uh, worth uh, giving Bill a hand. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Bill, for the uh, invitation. I'm pleased to share uh, the work we've been doing at uh, Mercy and Dignity for the past several years. As Bruce was talking, um, it reminded me of my early career. Um, I started my career as a rural physician for 12 years. I was part of the UC Davis system, and I practiced in Colusa, where I led the outreach uh, efforts. Um, you may not know this, but the birthplace of telemedicine in California was in uh, Colusa, California. And I bring that up because it highlights the importance of what um, Dr. Bomber and uh, Bruce was talking about, is early intervention is critical. And when I was in Colusa, we didn't have the luxury of flying our patients out. Uh, the window is very small, as you know. And um, um, through telemedicine and through technology, working with radiologists and neurologists, uh, we were giving TPA in a rural area way back in the late uh, 90s, early 2000. And I think it highlights the importance of us supporting work in rural counties where there's not many um, physicians. So I just want to start with that. So what I want to talk today is our transformational efforts uh, focusing on diabetes care as well as on the role of the clinical pharmacist in our um, system. We always start our um, presentations at the uh, Mercy with a reflection, and um, I think this is appropriate uh, to start uh, my talk, which is, uh, as Aristotle said, quality is not an act, it is a habit. Uh, so, as already mentioned, Mercy Medical Group is an integrated multi-specialty practice. We're a foundation medical group model affiliated with Dignity and now Common Spirit. I didn't realize how big the presence of Dignity is here in Sacramento. There's over 7,000 um, employees. They're the third um, largest um, private uh, employer. And Common Spirit now is the largest not-for-profit entity in the entire United States. Um, uh, it is in like 24 um, states. Um, so what I want to talk about today is how we transform our care using the patient-centered medical home. And I'll give examples on how we use that specifically for diabetes. Our journey actually started over 10 years ago. I joined uh, Mercy in 2008. Uh, the following year, I became um, a department chair. And within a few months of me becoming department chair, we faced a crisis in primary care. The things we hear now about uh, clinician burnout was true over 10 years ago. We lost a third of our primary workforce. But more important than that, if you look at this uh, uh, tabletop exercise we did on where the work was being done, the vast majority of the work was in the bucket of the uh, physicians. Very little to the nurses, to the MAs. I don't even have a pharmacist in this uh, initial study, but as Mark will tell you, having a pharmacist in the team is going to be a huge uh, benefit to us. So by the following year, what we decided to do is embark on a journey um, to team-based care using the PCMH uh, model. And these were our goals um, 10 years ago. Um, the talk we hear about clinician burnout was true then, how it's important to engage our patients and really have a team, everybody working at the highest uh, level of their uh, skill set, and it's really coordinated care. And that has since advanced, and this uh, diagram um, shows our philosophy of care, which I'm sure uh, applies to a lot of the large um, medical groups or any practice where we put the patient at the center of everything we do, having um, data to um, back us up, having a proper continuum of care, having um, 
everybody working together. Um, so our structure is uh, this, and this is a structure we have refined over the past several years. Um, we have a primary care excellence leadership structure composed of our guided leaders from the medical group and the foundation where we talk about strategy. We meet once a month, and then we also have them a full excellence team um, that meet um, once a month also. We have like 30 clinical sites, um, so it's important that we have a consistent message and everybody are following the standards. And then at the local level, uh, our teams work on how they improve their local area. Our sites vary from having like three doctors to some sites where they have like uh, 15 clinicians in one practice. And then we do have improvement work groups as well. So last week, um, I want to share this picture. We met last Wednesday, and um, this is, um, there were like over 100 people in the meeting. As you could see in this um, slide, um, after we start the kickoff of the meeting, we break in four groups that work on improvement um, efforts. Um, and these are just some of the examples of the work we've been working on over the past several years. One is really enhanced on our APP model. We all know that with the sources of primary care physicians, uh, utilizing our advanced practice providers is uh, imperative to our success. We uh, appreciate the value of huddles. Um, medication reconciliation is something Mark will talk about. But as you could see here, we also work on diabetes uh, management and blood pressure uh, improvement um, efforts. So this has been just some of the work we've done over the last um, many years. Um, and so. I can give an example of how that works for uh, diabetes control. As you saw in the slides that Bill showed, we're proud of how well we do with diabetes care. And we believe that's because we have the right uh, infrastructure to do that. It's one of our priorities. 80% of our population is diabetic. So what I want to describe here is the work that we piloted uh, three years ago in our internal medicine and family medicine side that has since become the standard of care for our group, we uh, participated in the initial Together to Go uh, initiative from the American Medical Group Association. One of the things that um, our team is most proud of was uh, after the first year, we were recognized as the um, uh, most improved large medical group um, in the country on the work we do with diabetes care. And that recognition was based on how well you improve your bundle score. Bundle score means you do well with diabetic control, uh, hemoglobin A1C, blood pressure uh, control, nephropathy, um, screening, and lipid uh, management. Um, and um, what we did was to really build an accountable care team. We use uh, registries, and we engage our patients. So this is the workflow we have. Um, so the accountable care team um, uh, really focused on those diabetics who were out of control. What we mean by that, our patients with hemoglobin A1C was about nine. So we have a registry, uh, then the, the clinic staff work with it, engage the doctors, and then we really um, engage these patients with phone calls. Uh, we remind them to come to the office. We have hemoglobin A1C machines when they come. And um, so these are example of the tools we use. Every, um, primary care physician has a list of their patients. Uh, it identifies the patients with smoking A1C is about nine. Our endocrinologists um, do the same um, as well. And so we created what we call pursuit lists to engage this uh, patient. So this is just an example of how the tool looked like. We know when the last screening was, we know what the result, and when their next appointment. Those who have no appointment are the ones we particularly want to engage. Um, so, in summary, what allowed us to succeed in this effort was uh, we had a tracking mechanism, we engaged the doctors, we had a consistent patient outreach, we, we knew when to engage endocrinology. In the initial stage of this, we didn't even have pharmacy involved, but now as we have rolled this across all our sites, as Mar will talk to you in her part of the presentation, pharmacists are also part of this with our uh, diabetes uh, steering committee. And, um, this is the results we achieved. Um, so if you look in 2017, we had over 400 and patients who were A1C was nine, and for those patients we track over time, as you could see, there's quite a dramatic improvement in hemoglobin A1C uh, control, and this is true for some of the other metrics. And um, 
as uh, how we do it, a lot of our transformation work. Once we're done with a pilot, we develop a best practice and then we share it across the organization. So for the last year now, this is our standard of care. And I think this slide speaks of the, the good work our team have been doing over the last year. This is the entire list of medical groups in uh, California who participates in the Align, Measure, and Perform. As you can see, we're the black bar on the right. Um, we're one of the top five or so medical groups when it comes with that medical control management. This is for keeping the smoking OIC less than eight, and this is for um, keeping it uh, less than nine. So um, I, I thought it was important to share that. I want to talk briefly about um, hypertension before I turn it over to, to Mar. Um, as I mentioned, Common Spirit um, is now the largest non for profit um, uh, health system in the country. And um, by some estimates, Common Spirit touches one in five Americans through the 130 plus hospitals we have in our presence in like uh, 25 states. And there's one ambulatory clinic metric the entire system is focusing on, which is blood pressure control, which is consistent with what we do with the Right Care Initiative. If you saw those initial slides, we're not happy with how we're doing with blood pressure control right now. If you look back a few years ago when we were actively involved in the Measure of Pressure Down campaign, we got our blood pressure control to as high as 80% of the population we take care of. But we lost momentum because we went to a new electronic medical record system and our group <coughs> has dramatically increased. When I joined the group um, 12 years ago, there were only 100 clinicians at Mercy Medical Group. And now um, we are almost 500 clinicians. So uh, with that growth, it's important that you sustain and, and, and maintain that. One thing I want to share about hypertension is maybe if you indulge me to share my personal story when it comes to hypertension. Four years ago, in June, um, my brother died. He was 54 years old. Uh, despite uh, our efforts to try to convince him to take better care of his health, um, he, he really didn't, and so he had a major cardiovascular event at age 54. That was in June, four years ago. And um, when I went home, I was in the Philippines a few times that year, I asked my other siblings, I'm one of seven kids, and I asked my siblings, I mean, you know, this is a wake-up call for us that we really need to take care of our uh, health. Um, if I could ask all of you to engage your doctors about um, uh, your health. I mean, diabetes runs strongly in my family as well as hypertension. And um, my siblings promised me, yeah, we're, we're going to check with our doctors. So November of 2016, um, the night of the election was a nightmare for me. And it's not for the reasons um, others may think uh, that was a nightmare, but I, I got a call from my sister-in-law where my brother um, was found unresponsive at home, was rushed to the emergency room, and by the time I um, got on the phone with my uh, sister, uh, handed me the um, handed the phone to the emergency room doctor, and essentially I found out my brother had a large thalamic stroke. So he had a hypertensive bleed. He was in the ICU for two months. I honestly didn't think he was going to make it. He was 47 years old. So fast forward um, uh, six months later, the following June, I went back to the Philippines and um, thankfully my brother survived. And he was able to talk, he had his uh, deficits. Uh, my brother's also a lawyer. But I remember when I went home, I asked um, my sister how he was uh, doing with his health and I saw the list of medications. My brother was on four blood pressure medications. Anyway, when I finally had a chance to talk to my brother the following June, I said, hey, I'm glad you're alive. I didn't think you were going to make it when last time I saw you, but I just had a question for you. I see in your list of medications, you were on four blood pressure medications, and um, what happened? Uh, he looked me in the eye, and really with a straight face, he said, I wasn't taking any of those medications. And I think it highlights really how important it is to have good medication reconciliation and how we engage our patients. We all know that our patients lie to us when they come to our office and we're not going to get the right answer unless we ask the right question. 
And the first time the blood pressure was elevated, you could understand you had a stepwise problem. But maybe by the third time the uh, patient, patient came back to the office and blood pressure was elevated, it would be an opportunity to really check about uh, compliance. So on that note, I want to um, invite um, my colleague, uh, Mar, um, to um, talk about the role of the clinical pharmacist in our efforts of blood pressure control, lipid management, and hypertension. My mom was a pharmacist, so pharmacists are here to my heart. <laughs> We're getting together, 
when we see a patient that might benefit from um, more carb counting or more, say, even like a grocery walk or um, a group visit, we send referrals to them. And when they see a patient that could use maybe a little extra care on their medications, they send that to us. Or they find someone who's got a lot of medications going on and maybe they don't know their medications very well. Maybe they have hyperlipidemia or hypertension. Then we'll manage that. So together, by creating more patient touches and more people in the mix, we're really taking those values to heart about that patient medical home model. Now, hypertension. Hypertension is really important. As Dr. Balalpot said, it's a common spirit goal. It's super important for tons of reasons, to reduce stroke, um, it's a comorbidity that's attached to a bunch of other comorbidities, so it's one of the big ones. Pharmacists are helping with hypertension. This here is an algorithm of our control pathways of where a patient might be able to get help with hypertension. And the key fact is we're leveraging all clinicians. <coughs> At this point, I really want to acknowledge and thank Charlotte Parker. Charlotte over there, she's setting this up, Greg. She's our NCQA leader and champion, and she has this amazing ability to take physician leadership vision and then make it into action and tangible, uh, real-world events and outcomes. And I'm partnering together with Charlotte, and we're coming up with some really cool, amazing things. One of the things we're doing related to hypertension is we're digging into the cardiology world. Charlotte's reorganizing some of the stuff within cardiology, and the vision is we're going to have a clinical pharmacist embedded right in cardiology. As you guys know, sometimes when a patient goes to see a cardiologist for Say, you know, a real in-depth cardiology issue that's not related to hypertension, they might inadvertently have hypertension. And then the cardiologist, their bandwidth is pretty darn busy, so they'll focus on what they need to, and they'll refer the patient back to the primary care provider to deal with the hypertension. Um, and there's a bit of a lag there, or maybe a little bit of a gap. Having a clinical pharmacist right embedded within that clinic will be able to get that hypertension managed right at the point of care immediately and close that gap a little bit. So that's one exciting thing we're doing with hypertension. This is just an example of how we internally socialize what we're doing, right? Who are the pharmacists? What are they doing? So we create these new and do shares. We share at meetings, we sh at events, we go to the different clinics. We like to vocalize, we're here to help and to accept referrals. And this no do share is just one of the ways that we showcase who we are, how we help, and how we communicate with us. Now I'd like to talk about medication adherence. <laughs> As everybody here probably knows, Medication adherence is probably one of the toughest metrics to achieve. It's triple weighted just for that purpose, but it's super important, as Dr. Blobot <coughs> mentioned in his story, um, and others can probably attest to. What you write for the patient to take is not necessarily what the patient is taking or understands. And there's a gap, right, capturing this data or figuring out what we do. And so we created a task force, and part of this task force was brainstorming where we can make a difference. Well, there's this issue. Right when the patient sees the physician, right at the point of care, that physician may not know if that patient is non-compliant or not. They don't have the information, and that patient usually doesn't self-willingly tell them everything because they want to look good, they do want to be the good patient, or they're forgetful or whatever um, for a variety of reasons. So we're leveraging the tools we have. One of the tools we have within MMG is this clinician point of care tool. It's a pre-visit summary um, that lists the different metrics that a patient might be due for. And so we thought, let's utilize this um, you know, clinician point of care tool. And what we did is we put on there, uh, we listed medications on adherence as one of the potential uh, things to check off and monitor for the patient you're visiting. Now, as you guys know that most of medication adherence data is latent adjudication data, and it is not clean data. It's got a lot of artifact in it. So when we rolled this out, we socialized that the patient is potentially 
not in here. We didn't want to label anybody, and we put some scripting and some dialogue and some education so that the physicians know not to say, oh, are you, what's going on, but to engage in a conversation and ask the critical questions. Are there any issues getting your medication? Do you have any trouble with cost? Do you want to talk to someone further? And this is the point at which um, a physician uh, would be able to send us a referral, and we'll dig in and spend that extra time with the 